the design of an instrument that actually carry out optical trapping, therefore, is quite simple. All you need is a source of light, in this case, a laser. You can actually then uh, span that laser through a number of optical, uh, optical pieces, and eventually you will actually fill the back focal plane of an objective lens, as shown here. Then that objective lens will collimate the light and form a diffraction limited spot uh, at that position, which is what is your trap properly, right? And of course, in addition to that optics, which is the basic optic for trapping, what you want is to have an eyepiece so that you have essentially another source of light that allows you to maybe uh, see the bead that you are trapping it through, an, through a, an ocular, through some kind of lens in your microscope, or you, can, you may want to actually project it into a, a video camera in order to be able to record the trapping. Okay, what wavelengths of light can be used for laser trapping? Okay, what you see here is a spectrum that is the spectrum of absorption of light by different, uh, different uh, uh, material. Uh, most importantly, water, which is all present in biological applications, of course. And so you see that uh, water actually has a increasing uh, a spectrum absorption towards the higher wavelengths, right? So as you go from the visible to the infrared, essentially you have an increase in the absorption of water cross-section, right? Uh, on the other hand, of course, we want to take into account the fact that when you are studying biological samples, we also have proteins and, and molecules that will absorb light. And notice that things like hemoglobin, for example, will have instead an increasing spectrum towards the lower wavelengths, towards the blues, for example, the wavelength in the blue. And so basically what I want to point out here is that if you look at this spectrum, you see that actually there is a point where we have a minimum of absorption for both uh, water, which is our background, of course, in biology, and all kinds of biological um, molecules and samples. And so that minimum of uh, light absorption actually occurs at 1060 nanometers, approximately. So this is what we call the absorption window of biological materials, assuming that biological materials, of course, contain water, right? And so this is important, why? Because when we are trying to manipulate molecules, or when manipulate biological molecules, in fact, or cells, or organelles inside cells, we want to minimize the amount of light absorbed by those organelles and by those molecules in order to minimize the damage done by the radiation, right? And so now, these days, actually, most laser uh, optical twisters applications actually use diode lasers. These are solid state lasers. And typically, these actually function in the wavelength regime between 835 and 840 nanometers. And they are pretty good. Actually, it's a good compromise to trap with minimal damage to the biological samples. Now, what kind of forces can we then generate with optical tweezers? Okay, it turns out that with optical tweezers, typically you can obtain forces that are of the order of a tenth of a piconewton, or 10 to the minus 13 newtons, to about 100 piconewtons, or about 10 to the minus 10 newtons, okay? So now we have, therefore, three orders of magnitude. Essentially, we have three orders of magnitude to play between 0.1 uh, piconewtons all the way to 100 piconewtons. Now, um, we are not accustomed in biology to actually talk about Newton, so maybe it's a good idea to uh, remember what a Newton is. A Newton is about, approximately about the weight of an apple uh, on the surface of the Earth, right? Because an apple is just about 100 grams, and 100 grams, or 0.1 kilogram, multiplied by the acceleration of gravity, which instead of 9.8, we are going to take it by just as a hand-waving arg argument, as a 10 meters per second square, that gives you exactly one Newton. In other words, 100 grams accelerated by a, an acceleration of 10 meters per second square gives you one Newton. So that's a weight of an apple on the surface of the Earth. Of course, the unit that I have been mentioning here is pico-Newton. Pico-Newton is 10 to the minus 12 Newton. Um, I believe I once calculated that uh, that corresponds approximately to the weight of a red blood cell on the surface of the Earth. So you, of course, cannot uh, sense or experience the weight of a 
red blood cell in your hand, but at least you can have a sense of the scale we are talking about, right? So, it turns out that one of the things that is wonderful about optical tweezers as a te technique to manipulate and study biological processes is that they not only allow you to exert forces on molecules, as we have seen, using the light exerted by light, the force exerted by light on, on matter, but they are also able to tell you how much force you are exerting on those objects, okay? So, in other words, you can not only apply force, but you know how much force you are applying. And that's one of the wonderful things about analytical optical tweezers. And so, for that, of course, you need to calibrate your optical tweezers. And we are going to now talk a little bit about the calibration of optical tweezers. Okay. The most popular method to calibrate an optical tweezer is to is the so-called virtual spring method, which assumes that the light that is trapping your bead, okay, is a harmonic potential, all right? That is a potential that is essentially goes, has the shape of a harmonic potential, in other words, quadratic, and that as you displace an object, say a bead that is in the middle of that trap, of that potential, and you displace it laterally by an amount delta x, then that object, the bead in this case, that has been displaced by that amount delta x, will experience a restoring force that is trying to bring it back to the center, which is exactly proportional to the displacement that you have generated. In other words, the force, the restoring force, is nothing but a constant kappa, which is essentially the stiffness of the trap times the, uh, the displacement from the center of the trap. You may recall, those of you who remember your uh, freshman physics may re recall that this is nothing but Hooke's law. Hooke's law that says that the restoring force is proportional to the displacement that we create, in this case, in the, in the bead away from the, uh, from the optical trap. It turns out that the position of the bead inside the optical trap can be measured these days with nanometer uh, resolution and even with sub-nanometer resolution. So it's possible to measure this delta x very precisely, and so we can measure this force quite precisely if we happen to know kappa, which is the stiffness of the trap. Now, how do we determine kappa, or the stiffness of the trap? In order to do that, one very popular method is to fix the bead to a covered slip, and then translate this bead across the beam of light, and then see what is the response of a photodetector. Namely, the beam of light eventually will end up hitting a photodetector, right? And you can, you can see that if you translate the bead across the beam, right, then the beam is going to be deflected, and you want to measure that deflection in a photodetector, okay? So, now, in order to determine kappa, or the stiffness of the trap, then what we want to do is we want to calibrate the trap stiffness using some known external force acting on the bead, okay? That can be done by different, in different ways. One of them is the Stokes law uh, uh, approach in which you essentially use beads that are trapped in the beam and that are displaced from the center of the beam by actually passing some kind of uh, flow of just the liquid around the, the bead. This flow will exert a drag force on the bead. The bead will be displaced from the center of the trap by a given amount, and you can calculate how much is that force that you are applying on the bead if you know the flow, the velocity of the, of the water passing around the bead, and if you know the dimensions of the bead. Why? Because that's what is called Stokes' law, in fact. Stokes' law says that the force experienced by the bead due to the flow of, of liquid around the bead is equal to the friction coefficient of the bead times the velocity of the water passing around the bead. If you know the velocity passing around the bead and you know that you have a sphere, then this friction coefficient is going to be nothing but six times pi times the viscosity of light of water, which you know, times the radius of the bead, which presumably you also know. So, as you can see here, everything that you need in order to calculate the force is is known by you, namely the viscosity, the radius of the bead, and the velocity of the, of, the, of the flow, right? So that is a way to actually apply a known force and see how much displacement that produces into the bead in the trap. 
And remember, you already know that that displacement in nanometers of the bead in the trap produces also a given displacement in the photodetector. So eventually you can relate the forces that you're applying and the displacement that you're applying on the bead to a displacement in the photodetector. So you essentially have a way of calibrating your optical trap. The other method is the so-called equipartition theorem method, which we will talk in more detail in a minute. But let me then summarize how do you calibrate the trap. Here is your trap, there is your bead, you displace the bead from the center of the trap by a given amount delta x, and we assume that the system is a linear spring and that there is a linear force restoring or trying to restore the position of the bead towards the center of the trap. In other words, we assume that the optical trap is a harmonic potential trapping the bead, okay? Next, what we are gonna do is we are going to grab the bead and move it relative to the trap center by different amounts, and we know exactly by how much we actually move the bead relative to the trap center. And at the same time, we are going to determine what is the response in the photodetector. In other words, the light, as you see, is going to be moving in response to you applying force on the bead. The light is going to experience a force, if you wish, that will actually deflect it on the photodetector. And you record that response in the photodetector. And then you determine the trap stiffness simply by using some known force, right? And so you see how much you displace the bead with that force that you apply. You know the force that you are applying because say it's a Stokes law, so you know the force, you know the displacement, then you can calculate kappa or the trap stiffness. So if you use the Stokes law, which I just told you before, this is a typical example of how do you actually uh, carry out this experiment. You have your optical trap. You can see that we are using two objectives, okay, to essentially collimate the light onto a glass chamber, which is our optical trap glass chamber. And then we have a bead that is trapped in the center of the beam here. We have a bead. The bead is normally moving in solution in the glass chamber, but this bead is trapped by the beam. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use a motorized stage to actually move at different speeds to create essentially a flow of liquid around the bead. And we can actually do that in a computer control manner. And so explicitly what is going to happen with the bead now is this, right? The bead it was originally in the center of the trap, but you are moving the whole, the, your whole uh, glass chamber is being moved in this fashion, back and forth at different speed, and that means that actually the bead is going to experience a drag force that is going to displace it from the center of the beam. And so that's how we actually determine the displacement, and because we know the velocity at which we actually are moving the motorized stage, then we have velocity, we have the force, and therefore we can calculate the trap stiffness of the trap. So here is a typical uh, data that you obtain that way. You have drag force here in the x-axis, right? Which essentially is your uh, result from the fact that you are moving the stage, and you detect at, at the level of your, of your photodetector what is the volts or the change in volts in your photodetector and you obtain a curve such as this one here that, as you can see, is very linear, right? Now, remember, you had previously done also another curve where you have what happens when you vary the position of the fixed bead and you pass it through the beam and you look at what happens to the photodetector. So you have another plot of detector output versus position. Since you just obtained now a new plot, which is shown here, of detector output versus force, it is possible to combine those two to obtain a force versus displacement uh, graph, which is essentially your calibration curve. And notice that it is very linear indeed. So that the assumption that the optical trap is a harmonic potential is a very good assumption. The other method of doing calibration is the so-called equipartition method. And that uses uh, a very important result in statistical mechanics that says that if you have a linear system, 
And that, that linear system is in the harmonic potential, just like we are assuming is the case of a bead inside a laser, an optical trap, then the mean quadratic fluctuation, the mean quadratic movement, displacement, just by fluctuations, just by thermal fluctuations of this object along one direction in space, in this case x, okay, is uh, given by this expression, namely that with each degree of freedom, x, associated with the system, with this linear system, okay, the potential energy of the system due to these fluctuations has associated a value of one half kT, where k is the Boltzmann constant and t is the temperature in uh, degrees Kelvin, okay, in absolute temperature. So, notice that I know the temperature of my experiment, of course, so I know that. I know the Boltzmann constant, right? So, if I were able to have a bead, say, in an optical trap, and look at the fluctuations of the bead in the optical trap, Okay, in other words, that I could determine the mean quadratic displacement of the bead in the optical trap just due to thermal energy, it's possible for me to obtain, therefore, this quantity, and since I know this quantity, that constant, and the temperature of the laboratory, then I can solve for the stiffness of the trap. Because the larger the stiffness of the trap, the smaller would be the fluctuations that your bead has, right? So, in fact, by looking at the fluctuations, you are able to calculate the stiffness of the trap, if you know the temperature, and, of course, the Boltzmann constant, which is a known quantity. Um, there are other ways of doing this. Uh, it is not a, a, a trivial uh, a calibration. Um, oftentimes, uh, people um, use what is called the spectral density of fluctuations of the bead in the trap, and that's because of the following. If you have a bead in, a, in, a, in an optical trap or in an optical tweezers, what is going to happen is that the bead is going to fluctuate and vibrate due to thermal energy. But it's going to fluctuate by a given amplitude for every different, at every different frequency. In other words, the bead will have what is called a spectrum of fluctuations, okay? And so, what people often do is they actually obtain what is called the fluctuation power spectrum or the spectral density of fluctuation of these beads in the trap in order to calculate the stiffness of the trap. And for that, they use a quantity called the corner frequency, which we are going to see just in a minute, the corner frequency, which is given by the stiffness of the trap divided by the friction coefficient experienced by the bead in the liquid, which again is a Stokes law and we know. So, in principle, knowing this quantity called the corner frequency, we can, in principle, calculate the stiffness of the trap again. Okay, so, um, to go back to the case of a bead in the optical trap, remember we have a bead in the optical trap, this is our experiment. This bead is fluctuating due to the fact that actually it's being hit, hit by many, many forces due to the molecules of water that are hitting. This is the Brownian motion, if you wish, okay? So, the bead is experiencing a Brownian noise behavior trapped in the middle of the optical trap. Well, the equation that describes the movement of the bead that is uh, surrounded by a viscous medium, water in this case, subjected to a fluctuating force due to the heating of the bead by the molecules of water, the Brownian force, and that is also placed in the center of a beam of light that is trapping the object in a harmonic potential is the so-called Langevin equation. And in this equation, you have three terms. One is the friction experienced by the bead in the viscous medium, the velocity of the bead, the instantaneous velocity of the bead. Then you have the fluctuating force due to the Brownian heating of the molecules against the surface of the bead whose average is zero, but whose quadratic value is not zero, and depends on the temperature of the, of the solution and the friction coefficient of the bead. And finally, you have the force that is trapping the bead in the center of the trap, that is trying to hold it on the center of the trap, which is the restoring force that is trying, every time you move the bead away from the trap, it tries to restore the bead back to its position, in an amount proportional to the displacement that you produce times the 
uh, stiffness of the trap. Well, you can solve this equation for delta x, and in fact, you can solve this equation for delta x squared, which is important, the mean quadratic fluctuation as a function of frequency, and the solution is given here in this expression. And you see that actually is a very simple solution. It says that if you want to know by how much amplitude is the bead displaced from the center of the trap at a particular frequency, omega in this case, right? Then you just have to use this expression, four times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature divided by the friction coefficient of the bead, parenthesis, that frequency squared plus a constant called omega c, which is what we call the corner frequency. And I remind you that I said that the corner frequency is nothing but the stiffness of the trap divided by gamma. Okay, so what this equation predicts is that if you plot the mean quadratic fluctuation of the bead as a function of frequency, what you're going to have is what is called a Lorentzian power spectrum, because this is a equation of a Lorentzian, and in fact, here it is. Okay, here is your red, take a look at the red curve here. It is flat for very low frequencies. Here is power in nanometer squared, because this displacement squared, remember delta x squared, that's displacement squared, so nanometer squared per, per hertz, and then this is a power spectrum, or it's a power density spectrum, and it's constant. Not, notice that the system is constant for all these frequencies, for all for low frequencies, all the way to the point where now, all of a sudden, you see a corner here where the, the spectrum will start decaying. This point where the actual turning occurs is called the corner frequency. And I told you that that's equal to the stiffness of the trap divided by the friction coefficient of the, of the bead, experienced by the bead. We know the friction coefficient of the bead because we know it's a sphere, and we know that the radius and of the bead, and we know the viscosity of the medium. So, if we can measure the power spectrum, as shown here, for a bead in an optical trap, in principle, we can calculate the corner frequency, and from the corner frequency, we can obtain the stiffness of the trap, which is what we need in order to measure forces with the optical trap.